Okay, thank you guys for coming. Um, so we're really excited, and I thought this was a good opportunity to um, let everybody know that um, we've been doing a lot of advocacy in electric airplanes, and ARMD um, has uh, let us get our foot in the door uh, to start looking at some technology development. And so this one slide that I have up here is a current presentation that Fixed Wing and the ARMD portfolio has put together for advocacy um, to the headquarters. They, they do have a small amount of resources in hyperelectric right now. It's about, I don't know, it's about 12 to 15 FTE, and we have, just currently, we have about, uh, what is it, like one and a half of that. But starting in FY15, we're going to get up to about five, five to six for the next couple of years, and then um, hopefully some more. And uh, we'll, be, we'll be working on uh, distributed electric propulsion, uh, power architecture, um, we'd like to obviously get something into an aircraft. Um, so we're still still working those ideas with ARMD, but we did just recently put in a seedling proposal, one of the team seedling proposals to do a distributed propulsion electric aircraft. Um, that is a really nice proposal, so I hope we have a good chance of that. Um, but you can see here what they're showing is a roadmap of you know, how fast they think maybe the technologies are going to grow. And although most of the things we do in fixed wing have a direct application or should have a direct application to transport, large transport vehicles, um, as we all know, the electric aircraft is going to be starting at a smaller scale before it's ready for large aircraft. So so we're all, all the rest of the portfolios for ARMD kind of show this N plus 1, N plus 2, N plus 3 generation of vehicles that are already a large scale vehicle. In this case, it's really going to be growing based on the weight of the airplane. So, so they, so they, it was great to see um, that through um, a lot of convincing that they finally agreed that they would even show the kilowatt class on this slide, um, realizing that we're going to, there, there's actually a lot to learn from the people who have already started working on electric airplanes um, that's going to help enable those, those larger platforms. So. So we we're gonna we're gonna try to do something in the kilowatt class here. Uh, start with you know airplane platform first, um, and, but really you know fixed wing's goal is how quickly we can get to a one to two megawatt size platform, which it would you know this says 50 passenger, but um, it would be somewhere like you know 60 or you no know, it was more like a 40,000 pound airplane. Just to give you, give you an idea what they're looking at. All right, so. Just wanted to show you that, just to let you know that we're getting our foot in the door. We're going to start doing this work. Um, but I was at the um, uh, electric aircraft symposium that CAFE Foundation put on in April. Brian Seeley, the president, um, gave this presentation. Um, he's also given it to Jay Wan Shin. And so I thought, well, this would be you know, a great opportunity. He happens to be going down to the AIAA Aviation 2013 conference. And so he stopped off here to uh, give us the presentation. So welcome Brian and his wife Anne. Um, just a little background on Brian. He's actually a doctor, is a medical doctor, but um, he has had um, you know a lot of interest in all sorts of uh, new technologies. Um, during his residency in eye surgery at uh, UCSF, is that San Francisco. He devoted his two-week vacation to earning his pilot's license, and this began a lifelong passion for flying. He joined the EAA, read and studied aerodynamics, and helped build two experimental aircraft. Brian received the, conceived the CAFE formula and founded the CAFE Foundation in 1981. So Brian Seeley is the, is the president, um, and this CAFE Foundation is plugged into a global village of innovators who are pushing the cutting edge of small aircraft design. Um, Brian will show how those innovations, electric propulsion and miniature sensor actuators can enable an enormous and sustainable expansion for air transportation. So everybody welcome Brian. Thank you, Star. It's a real honor to be here at Dryden Flight Research Center to talk to you about this topic that we're so passionate about. And my talk is the evolution of transformative flight. Uh, I chose this title. Um, it's actually the title of my AIAA paper giving uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday, down in Los Angeles at the AIAA meeting. 
And I thought it was important because the AIAA, as you know, has formed a transformational flight program committee. And we're trying to define just what is transformational flight. And I have the CAFE Foundation perspective on this. You may have others. And I want to alert you all that if I say anything today that you disagree with or that in any way offends you, it's only that I'm putting forward the position of the CAFE Foundation which is a private, nonprofit, all-volunteer organization. Now, let's remember that these magnificent creatures have evolved ideal capabilities over millions of years. And they do have one thing that our world of amazing aviation doesn't yet have. Quiet Eastol, that is quiet, extremely short takeoff and landing. And that's a key theme in my talk today. But they also have flawless autonomy even with a tiny brain. They do not run into each other in swarms. This is our group, an amazing group, the CAFE Foundation Board, a diversity of talents here. I wish I had time to tell you about each of these amazing people, but they are a really great national brain trust who drive what the CAFE Foundation does and who are responsible for much of what you'll see today. We started in 1981 with the CAFE 400 prize competitions for miles per gallon. And it brought forth all of these amazing airplanes, a real renaissance in the 80s. And then EAA National asked us to become their flight test agency. We became the miniature little NASA for EAA Oshkosh. In 2002, we started the Personal Aircraft Design Academy to convene small airplane designers who are quite capable people each year at the Oshkosh Air Show and give a trophy for them, and you see several notable ones here. These people, along with those at the Reno Air Races and in the Akif League organizations in Europe, can come up with some amazing airplanes, very sophisticated. And these are some of the headliners of this group, and you may know many of these people. Um, many of them have participated and come to our CAFE Electric Aircraft Symposia. And from this bunch, you can expect great things, and it's one of the exciting things about technology prizes is it brings out people like this. Uh, NASA chose CAFE to run its Centennial Challenges for Aeronautics. We started this in 2005, and here we are announcing it at Oshkosh that year. I think one of the reasons they chose CAFE is we had already been funded by FAA and EAA to build our flight test center, and it had these beautiful digital scales built into the floor to weigh airplanes very accurately. And we had <clears throat> what you see here. On the right is the CAFE Barograph, this amazing device that, that just um, straps on. Uh, I'm not sure quite what's going on with my laser, but in any case, we'll try this little laser there. This device is the CAFE Barograph with a free swiveling pedostatic, and it has a tiny little window there to send Wi-Fi into the cockpit and tell you your airspeed to a tenth of a mile an hour and your altitude to six inches. So it became the Small Airplane Directorate's FAA standard for certification. Uh, we have this e-totalizer, which is a wonderful thing you don't get with the piston engine because this is an actual dyno. This measures direct kilowatts being put into the motor, and it totalizes to tell you how many kilowatt hours you've used in flight. We have now for seven years had the CAFE Electric Aircraft Symposia, and this has turned into a wonderful international event. This year's event brought all of these headline speakers, um, Dennis Bushnell, NASA's Langley's chief scientist. Uh, this is Dr. Winfred Wilkie from IBM's Battery 500 project, Dan Raymer, who wrote the text for aeronautical students in America, and Bertrand Picard, who couldn't make it, but he was going to come and talk about the solar impulse. These are the major aerospace companies now that are participating in our electric aircraft symposia. This is a real coming, growing area. And we get a million hits per year on the CAFE Foundation blog, thanks to the curator for it, Dean Sigler, who does a wonderful job scouring the whole landscape of electric aircraft technology and bringing it into excellent articles there. 
I'm going to change gears and talk about the 2011 Green Flight Challenge that was sponsored by Google and funded by NASA and was pretty much designed and conducted by our CAFE Foundation up in Santa Rosa. This was heralded as the dawn of the age of electric flight, and I think you'll see why in a minute. We were offering, NASA was offering, world's or the uh, aviation's largest ever prize of $1.35 million dollars for an airplane that could do all these things, a 78 decibel takeoff at a 250-foot sideline microphone measurement, a 2,000-foot takeoff run clearing a 50-foot obstacle, uh, more than 200 passenger miles per gallon equivalents, and more than 100 miles per hour on the race course. And by golly, they did it. Uh, here's the race course up over Sonoma County, goes over a couple of small non-tower fields, very safe, run at 4,000 AGL. And <clears throat> I'm going to now show you a movie that NASA made that summarizes the event. And this is a nice, colorful view of what happened up there in 2011. <laughs> The dream, I guess, of everyone for a long time has been to have a flying car. And uh, if we can have electric flying cars, that'd be wonderful. It really is the dawn of a new era for aviation. It's general aviation, finally, with an electric aircraft. They'll be cheap, simple, easy to fly, renewable energies, quiet. That's what we need to revitalize the aviation industry. This challenge is uh, for a total of 1.65 million dollars. We'll use it for further aircraft development, um, just bigger and better, faster, onward and upward. We want to fly something or build something that's just as efficient as a Prius. This is our more cosmic entrance, the hybrid gas electric battery powered airplane, which is a first of its kind. Aviation is definitely one of the most pollutant transportation industries out there, so trying to move towards a greener and healthier mode of propulsion is definitely where we're all headed. They all have to fly an average of 100 miles per hour or greater. They require uh, 200 miles per gallon per seat, so with a two-seater we have to average 100 miles per gallon at 100 miles per hour, and there's no gasoline engine that can do that. The other thing is sound, so you want to be able to fly these at 78 decibels, basically the sound of a dishwasher measured at 250 feet. Two years ago they came out with a proposal for this. I laughed because it was impossible. It just couldn't be done. And yet in two years there's at least two airplanes here that I know of that electric that I think can meet the criteria. It's happening and it's happening exponentially. As the batteries get better, uh, these airplanes are going to get better. And when we see that it's going to start to change the way we move about the planet. <clears throat> so that's what this talk is about today. Change the way we move about the planet. Uh, 107 miles an hour for 200 miles in a battery-powered airplane that achieved 403.5 passenger miles per gallon. Really, truly an amazing achievement. They did it with a 145 kilowatt motor, 200 watt hour per kilogram batteries. Now, we used to think that was really great batteries, but wait till you see what's coming. Uh, these are now pretty ordinary batteries. We had there with uh, NASA's chief technologist, uh, Joe Parrish, helping us cut a big gasoline hose to dedicate the world's first electric aircraft charging station at CAFE, and this is powered by geothermal wells, so it is a fossil-free way to travel. Uh, this program, the 1.47 million that NASA invested, yielded 7.6 million in investment. More than 20 STEM graduate theses were written, and CAFE conducted all of this entirely with volunteer labor. So it showed what technology prizes could do. We gave this beautiful trophy that we designed. The trophy has lots more spots on it for future winners. And the chief technologist said, you know, this was one of NASA's smallest expenditures and yet biggest achievements in 2011. 
the White House took notice, and they wrote a white paper, and they cited us as sort of the poster child of a good technology prize, and that this could spark a new electric airplane industry. The report said, look at all the good things that technology prizes can do. They're crowdsourced, you get tailored performance results, extreme leverage of funds, the internet now enables recruiting of talent, there's a competitiveness involved, it stimulates STEM education, it'll grow new jobs, and you can win on the big stage. It delivers on time and on budget. You can have a series of linked prizes that give concurrent progress. And the intangible was the amazing camaraderie, kind of like the Olympics between the teams who were competing. The White House went further. They said this was so good that all the cabinet agencies now should start using technology prizes to achieve breakthroughs. So we got excited and thought, gee, what could we do next? How can we build on this? Well, <clears throat> the real sort of unsung and extremely important result at the GFC-1 was that this airplane, the E-Genius, took off and emitted only 65 decibels in full power takeoff at a 125-foot sideline microphone. Now that, folks, is really quiet. I went back to the PCAST, the President's Council of Advisors on Science Technology, and John Holdren was there, and I presented the idea of a quiet sky taxi. And I think they took note because I was invited to uh, a month later to NASA's Aviation Unleashed conference, and Annie and I went back to Virginia there, and. We met with the folks at, at Langley and we presented this idea. And we've been building on this ever since. Now, the, the Aviation Unleashed Conference had a nearly unanimous consensus that yes, we are going to have passenger carrying autopiloted vehicles and they'll deliver ubiquitous point to point delivery of all things, including both people and packages. So, to us, this is the main concept of transformational flight. This is different than what we have now. So what is transformational flight? I, I think it's really important to define it and to closely examine what it is. And this is what we believe it is. <clears throat> we came up with these 11 core requirements that are gonna change aviation. We need it to be safe, quiet, on demand, sustainable, fast, that is in door-to-door -door speed, affordable, accessible to the public, distributed, point-to-point, -point, public acceptable, and ubiquitous. Now that's a long list, but each of those is important. And if you don't think so, just put the word not in front of each one. Well, if it's not safe, then it's no good. If it's not quiet, it won't be acceptable. If it's not on demand, then it's just like scheduled airlines. If it's not sustainable, it's gonna ruin the planet. And so on, you go down the list and you see that every one of these features is indeed essential. Also, the yellow ones here are the ones that we really don't have with today's airline travel. We have all these new things to offer. Let's finally get quiet. Let's finally go when we want to go on demand. Let's have a sustainable system that we don't have to apologize for its emissions, and so on. So you can see how important this is. We think transformational flight will be autocatalytic to aeronautic research. In other words, each advance that comes along is going to spark more. And it won't supplant cars and trains and airliners. It will complement them. So let's look at each item. Safety is gonna demand six sigma, one in a million chance of a fatality, just like the airlines. Quiet is gonna be super quiet, less than 60 decibels at 125 feet sideline. I'm gonna show you the Schultz curve on this in a minute. But if you can't be quiet, then forget it, go home. You're not gonna play. On demand means whenever needed, and we've got to get rid of the TSA delays and the lines of waiting. Sustainable means not just environmentally, but successful in the marketplace. <clears throat> fast means door-to-door -door speeds twice as fast as anything else, and we can do that. 
affordable is going to, for the first time, demand a mass-produced airplane. And it won't be owned by an owner. It won't be locked in a hangar 99% of the time. It'll be always on the go. It's a sky taxi. Accessible. This is walk-up service. Imagine just walk up to a little airport. There's a line of yellow sky taxis. Climb in one and go. Distributed. Fly to nearly anywhere, not just to major hubs. Point to point. We won't be using or needing rental cars or freeways. Our point-to-point -point landings will be about six minutes from the desired doorstep. Public acceptable means acceptable into neighborhoods, okay? And ubiquitous simply means it's going to spread everywhere, nationwide and globally. Now, we've already proved the sustainable part and the fast part and the quiet part. That's what the GFC-1 did. So we've got to do the next steps. And let's remember that ARMD's mission statement says to solve the challenges that still exist in our nation's air transportation system, including traffic congestion, safety, and environmental impacts. Well, what challenges really need solving? Global warming, highway congestion, air pollution, renewable energy, job growth, STEM education, fossil fuel dependency, lost productivity, that is just waiting in lines or stuck in traffic, and then, of course, general aviation's horrifying collapse. And I say that because I love general aviation. The OIG just published their report showing a 36 percent decline in general aviation in the last four years. We have an aging fleet. We have fewer student pilots. The pilot population is down. Most of our GA manufacturers have stopped producing airplanes. This is a terrible, terrible problem. What is causing this terrible decline in general aviation? Well, there's the fuel cost and our 15 gallon per hour piston engines and the cost of owning a plane that sits most of the time in a hangar and the high cost of getting your pilot's license, the, the noise that is resented everywhere, the safety where 83 percent of our GA fatal accidents are pilot error the reliability of the engines that we deal with, the leaded fuel problem we're facing, and most of all, surface gridlock delays. So that you have this wonderful, fast, 200 mile an hour beach bonanza, and you land, and now you spend two hours in commuter traffic with your rental car. That's not a good formula. That's not the value proposition that's going to work. Look at what electric propulsion can do, and look at what quiet Eastol will do. All of the things I just mentioned can be solved if we go in this new direction. And notice, electric motors, on average, about 50,000 hours time between overhaul compared to 2,000 hours, no spark plugs to change, no oil changes, no hoses to break. It's a new ball game. And if you park the plane in the sun and it has solar panels on the wing, it may partially recharge while you're having lunch. So this is a transformative change to aviation. And these are the four things that I think research ought to look at to make us a sky taxi, a really bird-like aircraft. What might the sky taxi look like? Well, these are only some beginning fanciful ideas, many more to come. And we hope this is going to reach mass production. Again, that would really be a first in aviation. And we could have this bring a vast increase in ARMD research, as well as rejuvenating general aviation and its airports right when they need it. Take a look at this. You know, Bill Lear used to say, take the big bite. Look at the numbers, potentially, of what the sky taxi might mean. And over here, this is 1.2 million sky taxis. Look at the numbers of airplanes in airliners, UAVs, rotorcraft, ag planes, powered lift, uh, and, and the big one, 183,000, is general aviation. Then there's a big split and a huge rise up to this mass production market. So to us, this is the future. I know that NASA's mission at present 
looks to scale the small airplane up into the much bigger electric airplane. But to the CAFE Foundation, we think this is it. A massively high demand is going to be needed for these sky taxis. They're going to have to have transformative capabilities, a superlative value. They're going to have to be consistently reliable. And all along the way, the safety has got to be impeccable. And that has to be foremost, or the public won't accept it. So how do we accomplish this? We think the way to do it is lay out the niche requirements, which we have done, and then build the technology prizes to prove that it can be done and then concurrently explore and advance all of the related technologies to make these vehicles better and better. So the CGFCP stands for CAFE Green Flight Challenge Program. This is the follow-on building of the GFC-1. And the CAFE Green Flight Challenge Program is basically to bring about these capabilities, an e stole capability that only needs a 90-foot ground roll to reach 45 miles an hour liftoff speed, a climb out so aggressive that it'll reach 125 feet above ground level, only 420 feet from brake release, ultra quiet, meaning less than 60 decibels at a 125-foot sideline, autonomous, and I mean by this full autonomy eventually, Fast e which is this schizoid, conflicted business of a super low stall speed of 32 miles an hour, and yet an ability to cruise at more than 120 miles an hour. Electric propulsion, of course. Two seats side by side, that's enough because all the commuter vehicles are just 1.3 people on average. 200 passenger miles per gallon, which we now know is apparently easy to do and a ballistic parachute for safety. Put these all in one airplane, and <clears throat> we think we can do this before this decade is out in a concerted series of missions that are like the Apollo program. These are the missions. It's the Green Flight Challenge 2 for wheel motors, giving you the short takeoff. Next year after that, the Ultra Quiet Propeller Contest, then the Autonomous Contest, then the Fast East Ole Contest, and then the grand finale in year five, the Sky Taxi that puts them all together. The total program costs $3.1 million per year. And I'm happy to say that we now have serious interest from the Governor's Office of Planning and Research in California to help fund this program. The Sky Taxi is going to make you one of 245 million flyers not 590,000 licensed pilots, 245 million flyers, 120 miles an hour or more on your own road to everywhere. So what are the key technologies? I apologize to you, Star, because you wanted this talk to be about technologies, and here I've just been hyping our, our cafe contest, but now I'm going to dig into it, so hold on to your seat. Pocket air parks. This is an essential. This is how you do point to point. Okay, design the pocket air park. Well, I published a paper for CAFE back at the uh, January Dallas meeting, and you can look that up if you want. But it's basically, <clears throat> we are going to have to take off on minimal horsepower very quietly in small airplanes. Small airplanes because small airplanes take less power and they're quieter. Here's the Schultz curve, the FAA. This is the really hard to swallow but undeniable human physiology. This is what annoys people. 60 decibels is about where 10% of the population become highly annoyed. The backyard barbecue at the edge of the pocket air park must never see more than 60 decibels. Any plane that violates, violates that should have its airworthiness certificate lifted for pocket air parks and be only a sea toll airport type airplane. So pocket air parks, they mean proximity. They mean land where you want to go. And this is an amazing concept. You get out of the plane and you either walk or take a little scooter or a golf cart to grandma's doorstep. And it can be done. And look at the savings. If we have H for hub airports like Dallas-Fort Worth of 18,000 acres, that's way up here. And Pocket Airport down here, there's an exponential change in the size of the land parcel you're using. And 
not to mention all the hardscape and every other thing that goes with it. Here's Sonoma County hardscape. This is the USGS map. The red is where the buildings are. The pink is where the parking lots are. So you can't put your pocket airports in these places. And Sonoma County Airport's runways are up here. Now let's just put in some different sized airports. Okay, here we have a, a one mile strip. Here's a 2,000 foot runway. Here's a 1,000 foot runway. Here's the tiny little pocket airport, 500 feet by 250 feet. And this is a 1,000 foot circle, 1,000 foot diameter circle, which might be sort of like um, a helipad. Now, we have to see where we could put these. Let's sprinkle them around and notice that the tiny pocket airport can go almost anywhere. I mean, these are so small, they can be placed in that ideal proximity that gives you that super advantage of no more gridlock waste of time. This is the core message of my talk, that the pocket airport has got to be. You could sprinkle pocket airports all around my neighborhood because there's plenty of parcels big enough. And this would be about a 420-foot runway, one hectare of land. Again, you need that zero to 45 mile an hour liftoff speed in only 90 feet. Remember, 90 feet's the distance from first base to second base. And you've got to be nearly silent when you do this. And if you're going to get that kind of takeoff acceleration, you're going to have to have a wheel motor. Here's the pocket airport in concept. And you see the crosshatch area is the little 90 foot ground roll. And then you climb and climb and climb and climb. And over here, you reach 125 feet so that when you cross that backyard barbecue, you're less than 60 decibels. Now, there's a lounge on each side. There's transit and buses. And you can see overlaid in the middle there that green area. That's an NFL football field. So it gives you an idea of how small this is. Powered lift, <clears throat> which has this inherently higher noise than a fixed wing, is going to be one of our challenges here. The heliports might end up having to be larger than the pocket air park. And let's look at this. The pocket air park for 60 decibels is in the middle here. And if we have a, a, a powered lift airplane that has the noise penalty and is, say, 6 decibels uh, louder, then it's going to be out here on this 500-foot circle. It's going to require a bigger land parcel. If it's 12 decibels louder, it's way out here on a 1,000-foot circle. So this is one of the big aeronautical research challenges is solve the powered lift noise issue. Uh, distributed point-to-point -point air travel. Well, the sky taxi is not going to infringe upon airline business on trips of over 500 miles, maybe even over 400 miles. But it could tremendously enhance airline travel if we put the pocket airport right at the big hub. So here's San Francisco International, and those little yellow rectangles are the pocket airports sitting right on top of the terminal building. And so forget the airporter and the park and fly and all of that non. Just take it from your 50 or 60 mile away suburb and drop you off right there at the gate for London. You can do it at Dallas-Fort Worth as well. Those tiny little orange rectangles there are pocket air parks. Believe it or not, that's how big that airport is. Here are a sprinkling of pocket air parks potentially around San Francisco, putting you within walking distance of any attraction in the city. And here's the kinder, gentler view of the pocket air park. Put it in a neighborhood, integrate it with community gardens and ball diamonds and bus stations. Maybe even have a community garden there and, and the connection to the transit train. And in undeveloped countries, put pocket air parks in remote places so you don't have to dig through the jungle and build highways. Now, eStole is the other technology, and this is a real challenge. Taking off quietly, like this bird does, can be done, <clears throat> and we're going to need to do it with high efficiency and low power. I'm going to show you a movie of the spectacular short takeoff and landing competition at the Valdez competition in Alaska. Uh, you may have to start this movie. Thank you. A click should do it. I think you have to get right on that emblem.
some of these guys probably have helium in the wings to help them get off the ground. I come. So what you're seeing there are takeoff rolls of about 90 to 100 feet and landing ground rolls of about the same. Uh, this is a tall order, and the other ingredient for the pocket air park is going to be these unprecedentedly steep approaches. How are we going to come down at a 21.3 degree angle so that we don't eat up all that runway at the pocket air park before we have to land and roll to a stop? Well, it's going to take some nifty devices. Um, I'm going to diverge for just a moment here and talk about one of my favorite topics, the runway in the sky. Now, imagine you have an app that is in the glass panel cockpit that presents you this picture of an airport. It's a fake airport. It's a virtual airport. It's sitting just like you see it, except that it's 4,000 feet above the ground. And you're going to fly and approach a downwind base leg and final. You're going to land there. You're going to flare. And the whole time, everything you do is being recorded. Every stick input is being recorded. And we're going to see how steep an approach you can make. And you're going to do it safely. And if you stall, just recover your 4,000 feet above the ground. Oh, and you have a rooftop parachute on the vehicle as well. You can program this app to put in a 15-knot crosswind and make it even more challenging. And you can send up the world's most ace test pilot to do it again and again and again. And guess what? Just like the DARPA autonomous car, that software can learn from that ace pilot what the inputs are to achieve a pinpoint landing. And it'll remember them, and it'll duplicate them, and it'll become autonomously as good as Chuck Yeager. Now, this is a very strange slide because it is a double-slotted flap on a motor glider. You don't see that much. Motor gliders don't worry about slow landing speed, but here's one from Portugal. Wonderful design. Two electric motors that fold away into the tail cone. Retractable gear. A really slick airplane. They didn't quite make it to Oshkosh this year. And remember, spoilers could be the secret to that steep approach that we need at the pocket air park. Spoilers out, coming down 1,400 feet a minute at a slow airspeed, put the spoilers away, and touch down gently with a low sink rate. You could even use Kevlar fabric to greatly increase wing area because after all, with a 32 or 35 mile an hour stall speed, the loads on that fabric aren't so great. And you might thus really be able to help the slow flight of an airplane with these kind of morphing technologies. The Breguet <clears throat> 941, by blowing these big propellers over the complicated flaps, got a 7.7 .7 CL max. And Dr. Za from University of Miami presented similar 7.8 CL max theoretically with his CoFlow jet airfoil. And this is really cool. It has a leading on the top skin, a slot that blows on the rear of the top skin near the trailing edge, a suction slot. You could pressurize the front slot and apply suction to the rear one using hollow wing spar tanks. And you'd only have to use these for a total of about 10 or 12 seconds in the approach mode. Perhaps you'd use them on liftoff as well, but it wouldn't take a continuous giant turbine air bleed off in order to operate this. What's more, if you were to take this system and do it in reverse, you would have the world's most effective spoiler. You could turn on the adverse reverse flow and do a super steep approach, and then at the penultimate moment, valve the system to reverse flow, bring the high CL max, and do a bird-like total kinetic energy bleed off for a soft, gentle, slow touchdown. So this kind of swoop arrest, again, a huge area of potential research, a wonderful thing to try at a virtual runway in the sky. By the way, these steep climb outs, to give you an idea, the Disneyland Matterhorn's 150 feet tall. So 
we're going to have to get airborne in 90 feet and climb out steeply and quietly and reach a height about like the Matterhorn before we leave the airport property for these pocket air parks to work. Ride quality, you are working on that right here at Dryden. The aeroelastic study, this could be a tremendous help because one of the real sources of reticence for people getting in a sky taxi is, oh, those small airplanes are too bouncy for me. Well, can we solve that with technology? Well, in Germany, they have this LIDAR system that looks ahead and can see turbulence. And we might try altering the system so that it looks diagonally upward or downward to enhance its effect. And we might put this in with an anticipatory sensor suite that can detect small changes in pitch roll and yaw instantaneously react or overcome them and take the curse out of ride quality in a light wing loading airplane. So I'm now going to show you just a very brief movie here. This is from Dave Wolpert at NASA Ames. Many of you have seen this movie. It's a flimsy wing in a wind tunnel that flutters. It flutters at 15 and a quarter meters per second. But with these smart trailing edge tabs as a controller turned on, it takes away the flutter, and you can jack up the airspeed in the tunnel higher and higher without flutter. And so here's the movie. You may have to start for me. So we'll, we'll start at 15 and a quarter meters per second, and it's fluttering. And he's going to tame it by turning the controller on here in a second or two. Um, <clears throat> now you'll see there's the controller turned on. Now the tabs are smartly activated. And what goes on in the movie then is the tunnel speed goes higher and higher and higher and that wing just sits there nice and calm. The smart tabs are a concept that is a huge potential area of research. Okay, we can skip to the next slide. Um, what about a cargo version? You know, if you look at the little FedEx uh, Cessna caravans, those guys load packages in there from Amazon.com crawling around on the ground and stuffing them in the belly pod of that airplane. It's a terrible system. Why not have containerized cargo in emission-free cargo planes? Material science. Now, this comes from your friends at NASA Glenn Research Center. We know that these amazing technologies of 3D printing and CNC milling are here. You can do these in your garage now. And the nano magnet is another breakthrough by Building the fine structure of a magnet, you can get a permanent magnet twice as powerful as the most powerful magnet today. What's that going to do to electric motors? And look at these gnarly nanofibers. This is not ordinary fiberglass or carbon fiber. These toes have hairs on them that interdigitate like Velcro, and this gives a tremendous strength increase, so much so that you'll see here on the lower corner a 45% reduction in empty weight of the airplane. This is going to be huge. Here's a graph that tells you what it means. Um, the legend here shows the weight empty compared to gross weight, and the Mooney is 0.65 in that ratio. The e Genius got it down with carbon fiber to 0.53. The Pipistrelle Panthera got it down to 0.42. Well, with the NASA Glenn nanofibers, we're going to get down to this. And when you get it down to this level, this purple line shows you that the light sport aircraft of 600 kilograms can have a very nominal lift to drag ratio of 15 or 20 to 1, even on the crummy 200 watt hour per kilogram batteries. So reducing that empty weight fraction is huge. And that's one of the unsung technologies that's coming. Also, automated fiber placement will build these airplanes in mass production with robotic um, layups. Now, the lithium air battery is said to approach 1,000 watt hours per kilogram. What does that mean? It is amazing. Look at the purple line. <clears throat> the purple line is 1,000 watt hours per kilogram. And again, this is a, <clears throat> a small light sport aircraft. With those super batteries, we're going to get down to L over D ratios of maybe 10 or 15 and keep our weight well below the light sport aircraft weight. 
why do I choose a light sport aircraft? Well, number one, it's, it's much easier to license. Number two, it accommodates two people. It's kind of the benchmark standard for how to get into the airplane business in a hurry. So if you have a 1,000 watt hour per kilogram battery, I can see almost no reason for you to worry about using hybrid propulsion. Uh, the, the batteries are so good, why would you bother carrying along a stinky piston engine? Here is the Breguet formula applied for range. Now what this is telling us is that if we put everything together, we put in the super low empty weight fraction, the super good batteries, this is the kind of outcome that we're going to get. Uh, a range of just 200 miles will come clear down to a 10 to 1 L over D and easily fall under the light sport aircraft weight. So <clears throat> the point of all this is converge these technologies, push all these technologies together, and you're going to have unbelievable airplanes. You can even do it for an airliner. Many of you have seen this slide from Boeing, that when you get those 1,000 watt hour per kilogram batteries, the green line here, you're going to get up around a 1,000 mile range with an electric powered airliner. Solar. Many of you are interested in solar, and solar has so much energy available. At the bottom here you see 4,000 exojoules, enough to power the whole planet. Why aren't we using it? We now have these curved panels we can put on the wing, and they'll charge the plane while you're having lunch. And we know now that Eric Raymond is doing this. He has his solar-powered airplanes that will sustain level flight on pure solar power. Here was a wonderful talk from last April's Electric Aircraft Symposium <clears throat> uh, up in Santa Rosa. 65% energy capture by these new double photon uh, panels that they're working on at UC Santa Barbara. So again, what's out there is staggering in what it can do. Now, in vertical takeoff and landing, or I should say powered lift, if we look at the history of powered lift, <clears throat> The ones that are in active service and are in successful production, and by that I mean a grand total of maybe 600 of these aircraft around the globe, these are high disc loading aircraft. They are military aircraft. They are not quiet aircraft. And that, as I alluded earlier, that is going to be our big challenge. Most of the other powered lift airplanes were explorations that are now in museums. This was a demonstration in Washington of an extremely high disc loading, 1,600 pounds per square foot. You can see that the Potomac River there is churning up uh, uh, a mist because of the downwash. Here's the opposite extreme. This is, you know, 0 0.09 pounds per square foot disc loading, this human-powered helicopter. Well, granted, it was extremely quiet, but how is this going to go 120 miles an hour point to point? And here's an in-between, as you all know, the Moeller Sky Car. Um, <clears throat> the down thrust and noise emission of this are simply not going to fit this 60 decibel absolute requirement. We're going to have to do some real magic to make this work. Now, here's a powered lift movie that brings up another issue about powered lift. I've been showing you pocket air parks, and these are beautiful maintained runways and they have no gravel and they have no leaves on them. They are not the land anywhere model, but rather they're a shared community resource agreed upon that it's expected the vehicles will come here. The dream of powered lift and VTOL is I can land anywhere. But when you start coming into neighborhoods, there's another issue with landing anywhere, and it's the unprepared surface. So I'm just going to show this little movie to remind us that this is another aspect we have to pay attention to. There's another example here in just a moment. So the powered lift 
as a player in the, in the world of transformational flight is going to have to really address, this is going to take a lot of research on noise, on downwash, on how to get a fast cruise speed, how to get the high mileage, how to have the long range, how to do the fly-by-wire control of distributed propulsion and do it flawlessly without an accident that would sour the public on accepting these new vehicles. And finally, the certification cost, which unfortunately is projected to be over a billion dollars. And that is a terrible hurdle, and it's going to take some close work with the FAA to overcome that. High mile per gallon. Now, this is amazing. Look at these two airplanes, and look at their cost of operation. And on the left there, you see that e-genius, tiny, one cent per mile cost of direct energy, and the Cirrus approaching 50 cents a mile. And notice that the airplane is not only good, but it's better than these two cutting-edge electric cars. The, the airplane is actually better than the car, and yet it's going twice as fast. This is an amazing thing. The Breguet energy equation, or range equation, was beautifully modified by Martin Hepperly, and this is his modification. And I just love this. I, I know it's tedious, but I, I want you to bear with me a minute. The formula says the energy density, this is kilowatt, uh, or excuse me, watt hours per kilogram, total efficiency from battery to propeller thrust, the g force in meters per second squared upside down, the lift to drag ratio, and then that ratio of how much do the batteries weigh compared to the gross weight of the plane. Well, better batteries are going to help this. G, you don't get to change. Efficiency, we can get close to 70, 80 um, percent. L over D is the big one you can change, and the energy density of the battery is a thing that's going to get better and better and better. And you don't even have to work on that because the automotive industry is going to do that for you. And interestingly enough, this number here, watt hours per kilogram is the same as Newton meters per kilogram, which is the same as meters squared per second squared, and the G is second squared per meter, and those are the only two dimensional items in this entire formula. So when you multiply them together, guess what you get? Meters. Meters of range. So the unit's analysis is just beautiful. I like the idea of an L over D max of 20 to 1. I love the idea that if something goes wrong with the motor controller or the batteries or anything else, I'm in an airplane that has a 20 to 1 glide. Not only that, this will help assure high mileage, it'll add safety, it'll extend the longer range of the plane, and it'll help, because of low span loading, the plane to have a good climb out. Now this formula <clears throat> can be converted so that it doesn't tell you the range, but rather it tells you the gross weight. So we flip the formula around, and now we can look again at this gross weight issue. And here's the surprising thing. <clears throat> the two-seater, 1,320-pound, 600-kilogram, right across here, the light sport aircraft. Look what happens when you cut the range requirement down. How do we cut the range requirement down? We make these little short hops, and we use airplanes that are like Black & Decker drills. We just pop in a new battery pack. We don't have to wait for the 1,000 watt-hour per kilogram battery. We just pop in a new battery pack. And if you do, you already today, with 200 watt-hours per kilogram, you already have 20 to 1 L over D as a perfectly feasible kind of airplane to bring forth. So it's here. What are the barriers? OK, here's the big barrier I mentioned. A multi-rotor fly-by-wire VTOL is projected by NASA to cost over a billion dollars to certificate. And we have to certificate because these are flying people for hire. Now, even bad enough, a GA airplane has to amortize a hundred million dollar investment to get certificated to carry people. Even a GA autopilot, by the time it goes through all the certification, twenty million dollars. No wonder these avionics cost so much. Going pilotless is a huge cost saver, and I'm going to show you the business model in a minute. It's going to demand this near perfect safety record, not only uh, in the technology prize competitions, but in development. We can't afford to have any accidents. 
bunker pilots. Well, what if we flew these sky taxis with bunker pilots? Or what if we flew them with remote crews? What this does to the business model is incredible, and I'll show you in a minute. Going on to wheel motors, this exciting electric motorcycle goes zero to 60 in one second. It's got so much torque at zero RPM, it just makes smoke. And the density of power that you can put in to a wheel motor, literally, our little, our little 606 tires, Goodyear tires on our Pipers and Cessnas, they can be turned into powerful accelerators for takeoff with perhaps no weight penalty at all. Uh, look at all the other things this will do for you. Regenerative anti-lock braking, traction control, it'll self-retract the landing gear on a spool, it can help you back up in reverse on the ramp, you can have autonomous steering. The plane will never run its propeller when there are people around. It won't even turn on its propeller till it reaches 38 miles an hour approaching liftoff because everything else on the ground is done by the wheel motors. So it's pedestrian safe and you might even get dual use out of it when you retract it up into the wing. Now the wheel motor is driving the air conditioning pump or it's driving the CoFlow jet airfoil pump. And so you can see why there's so much excitement about a wheel motor competition. And this is just a silly slide to show a Goodyear airplane tire with a pancake motor plastered on the outside. But the real serious teams in this competition are going to integrate the actual wheel with the motor. And it won't cost 10 pounds per wheel. It may cost zero pounds per wheel compared to the existing 18 pound tire wheel disc brake that makes up the Cleveland 606. So this is hugely exciting, and here's a, here's a graph that shows that <clears throat> we can do this 90-foot ground roll here with a 31-horsepower wheel motor, 0.6 Gs, getting you up to 40 miles an hour in just 91 feet. So again, the physics are doable. And here's how we intended to do it. We have the RAS, the Runway Acceleration Simulator. It's a little uh, uh, three-wheeled cart. It's got a swing arm at the back like a motorcycle. The teams come, they bolt, on, they bolt on their unit back here, and we then drag race them and see who can get zero to 45 miles an hour in the shortest distance. Ultra quiet props, well, you know about the famous Lockheed Y-03A, got down to 60 decibels in a 125 foot flyover. That was terrific for back in the 70s with a, with a big continental engine. Low noise is going to favor the lightweight airplane. So here's the formula that just says the more horsepower you use, the noisier it's going to be. Extreme example, a 600 horsepower regional 10-seat airliner compared to a little 50-horse light sport aircraft, 11 decibels just right off the bat penalty. That's a, a thing that makes us yearn for these high L over D airplanes that don't take very much power to fly. Piling on these, these little sky ponies, these little sky taxis, lots of them taking off. The noise is additive, but not like you might think. Two of those 60 decibel planes will jack it up to 63 decibels. All the more reason why we have to push this noise lower and lower and lower. And here's a happy slide that shows with 600 pounds of thrust here, which is what you're going to need in the light sport airplane, we could get all the way down to 46 decibels if we do it with a 12-foot prop turning only somewhere around 550 RPM. So these are going to be big, slow-turning props, and they can be incredibly quiet. What else about the quiet prop? What kind of shape will the blade have? And will we use synchrophasing, like this NASA study that said you could get this tremendous quieting? Now, granted, it's only at a, a one or two azimuths, but Tremendous quieting if you synchronize the blades for destructive interference. And what about what I call the ANR prop, the automatic noise reduction prop, okay? This is where blades are of different diameter. They're all coaxial. They've got different shapes, and they're integrated so that when they're all done with the air, that stream tube is uniform. It is not churned. How would you do that? Well, you might stack motors coaxially. Each motor is programmable independently. Each propeller hub there is able to spin in a concerted interplay with the other prop, and you just tune it like tuning a tuning fork until the noise disappears. 
Okay, so this, I'm, I'm going to skip this slide. Here's the cart where we test these out on the runway. We, teams come, they bring their motor and their prop, they bolt it on. We drag race them down the runway, and the one with the quietest noise wins. We're going to use the same uh, 60 phone metric that they used for the IARPA comp competition for UAVs, the Great Horned Owl, and this is a fair perception <clears throat> of subjective noise. The lowest decibel wins, but you have to be generating thrust when you make that noise. You have to push that 600-pound propeller acoustic simulator cart with a 0.3G acceleration while going 50 miles an hour past the microphone array. That levels the playing field. That means you're really making the thrust you're going to have to make. The autonomous contest, well, we've got this amazing autonomous land on a carrier airplane now. And <clears throat> The purpose of this autonomous competition is to grow the public trust. You've got to put, let people understand that these airplanes really could make pinpoint landings autonomously. Uh, that contest, as we see it right now, is the plane will have to do everything. The safety pilots will sit side by side. Neither one of them will touch stick or rudder. And the video cam will monitor them. And the plane has to taxi, take off do the 4D flight path, avoid uncooperative traffic, show envelope protection, make a pinpoint landing, do a simulated dead stick, and any other increasingly difficult task. All this in one contest, and that's going to really wow the public. Safety, electric propulsion is going to be safer. These motors don't quit. They go 50,000 hours of continuous running. They have better throttle response more precise, ideal for tuning propellers. And this battery fire business, look at the fleet of electric cars. There's been one known fire in the Chevy Volt, and that was a car they crashed into a wall and parked for three weeks in the corner, and then they wondered why it caught on fire later. Um, here is synthetic vision, a, a, a general idea of how beautiful modern avionics can make flying and how much better even in the near term we can get GA's uh, flying safety when we implement this kind of thing. I want to move on to the next slide. So GA fatalities are 83 percent pilot error and not many of them are due to mechanical. And remember these gold numbers, 13.6 fatals per million hours, six per million hours in cars, three per million hours in airlines, and guess what happens if you take away all those 83 percent of pilot errors? Amazing. The GA comes down to just 2.3 fatals per million hours. It surpasses the airlines. So that's the dream. That's the model. That's the goal to make this autonomous system a massive implementation. And by the way, they all have vehicle parachutes. And we're going to try to get the vehicle parachute save altitudes to even below 200 AGL. So how can we make the CAFE Green Flight Challenge program as safe as possible? The high L over D max, the low stall speeds, the good glide ratio, the good handling qualities, smart autonomy with mechanical backup, and a vehicle parachute. That's all part of the program that we've put together. Fast e stall, just to quickly finish and go through this, Dan Raymer did this neat study at the Electric Aircraft Symposium. He said if you do a wing morph with extension panels, you can have your 32 mile an hour stall speed and cruise at 232 miles an hour in this electric airplane with today's technology, not even with the fancy batteries. So the Sky Taxi will be no slouch on its little short hops. And here's another slide that just shows that if you get your CL max up high, like here, uh, 4.5, you're going to be able to get 165 mile an hour cruise speed and still have that 32 mile an hour stall speed for the pocket air park. And this graph, a lot of detail here, but the nutshell is the Sky Taxi in the door to door trip speed, the Sky Taxi here is way faster than the red dotted airliner or the car, even out to 400 or 500 mile trip lengths. This is because you're landing so close to grandma's house and you don't have to get on that freeway. 
Plus, you don't have to go through TSA or a ticketing line or walk to the gate or do the boarding or the unboarding and the overhead bins, none of that. So the fast e stole is going to be a race. First, you do the slow flight part. You show that the plane can go slowly. And then you get those planes on a three-kilometer race course, and you see who's the fastest. And that's the winner. The final race, <clears throat> excuse me, the final competition is the Sky Taxi finale. And that's where you put it all together. The planes have to show up. The teams bring their planes, and they demonstrate all the capabilities in one airplane. Here's the scoring formula, which combines their speed and their decibels, because those are the two key things, those are the two figures of merit once you have proven that you are a pocket airport type of aircraft. Now, this is, uh, I, I want to emphasize when I give you this business case, I am not an entrepreneur, and I am not doing this because I intend to start the next Starbucks of uh, Sky Taxi franchises, but this is a pretty exciting aspect. We were asked by J. Wan Shen, to make sure that there is a future for this kind of sky taxi. How will it actually make money? Okay, it's got to be safe. It's got to be commercially viable. In fact, it's got to be very profitable and <clears throat> has to be transformative. Every time you make a big change to the transportation system, years of prosperity will follow. NASA's chief scientist, Dennis Bushnell, said that this sky taxi is a potential trillion-dollar market. It could give a thousand-fold increase in the production volume for General Atomics and Aerovironment and other UAV manufacturers, and it could rejuvenate general aviation. Now, I have to skip through that slide because I've, I've done it already, but here's the metric that really counts in the business sense. It is dollars per passenger per mile an hour. And the simple message here, without going into detail, is the car and the airliner are not so hot. The tiny little dark green is the sky taxi, and this is dollars per passenger per mile per hour. And on all these trips, San Francisco to LA, San Francisco to San Diego, and, and Seattle, the sky taxi just hands down is the winner on this important metric. Here is a graph that shows that most of our trips, I mean, this is a huge market. 80% of our trips are less than 500 miles. So there's plenty of trips out there waiting to be taken. Now this, ignore the, the airplane picture because it's only conceptual, but it's the idea of a, a pilot with two passengers in a plane that'll go 100 miles at 125 miles an hour, and it'll go in and out of pocket air parks. What can you do with this? Well. Up in our area, San Francisco, you could have 99 airports already built. They're not pocket air parks, but they're already there. And most of these people would like to come to San Francisco. So let's add one pocket air park on the roof of the Exploratorium on Pier 17. Let's approach it from over the water in our quiet sky taxis. And what would this do in terms of a business? Oh, and by the way, we use robotic battery swapping. It takes 90 seconds to swap the battery on the Sky Taxi and give it another 100 miles. And this is going to enable even today's batteries to put us in play with a 20 to 1 L over D. Um, I've already shown this slide. Here's the final result $216 per hour to operate this. This takes into account everything insurance. We're paying $12 million a year to the Port of San Francisco. That's the going rate for, for uh, using the pier for the pocket air park. This pays the pilot $120,000 a year to fly these sky taxis. <clears throat> and they're highly trained pilots. And here's the bottom line. You can take from Santa Rosa to San Francisco Embarcadero a trip that by car is 65 miles and costs you an hour and 45 minutes. You can do the trip in 26 minutes for $88. And if the vehicle were fully autonomous or had bunker pilots, it would only cost $24. And what's exciting is when you put all this together and you implement this with 250 sky taxis, it's going to take some venture capital. You make a $100 million profit. That's just in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
what about New Orleans, Seattle, Long Island, <clears throat> New York, Chicago, and so forth? So you see this is feasible by physics. It's been predicted by NASA's experts. It's driven well by economics. It's urgently needed. It's beneficial to everyone. We met with Jay Wan Shin on June 14th in Washington, and our team sat for almost two hours with him, presented this. He said he wants to work with us toward a joint announcement of this in August. We'll see what happens down in L.A. in the next three days. We're very excited about it. We're thrilled to have the governor's office now on board. And so we think that the CAFE Green Flight Challenge Program is going to launch transformative flight as an enormous new domain for NASA research. Thank you. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, the pocket airport uh, idea is intriguing, but have you given any thought to the parking around that for the vehicles that fly in and out? <clears throat> um, it's an excellent question, and of course the ideal is that we have what uh, you know Peter Calthorpe calls walkable communities, and so you walk to the pocket air park. Now, if you've got a lot of baggage, that's problematic. DOT 500 vehicles that are licensed for 25 mile an hour travel on residential streets are a remedy assuming that the pocket air park is in that kind of proximity for people. It's obviously going to take time to reach that implementation, but you have to plan ahead or we're going to still be stuck with our CTOL, conventional takeoff and landing, 5,000 foot runway regional airports, and those don't solve the point to point need. Parking at the air, uh, air parks, uh, we're approaching autonomous vehicles as well, uh, autonomous cars that, that may you know, be like a taxi you call, it picks you up, it delivers you at the pocket air park, and then it deadheads off to do another job for someone else. So I don't have a ready solution for the parking issue, but I am a total believer in minimizing hardscape. Okay. Yes, sir. I don't know if you've heard uh, about Elon Musk is going to uh, shortly introduce this notion of a, what he calls a hyperloop, which is some sort of two transportation system. Um, have you thought about how something like that may impact the entire business model you're proposing? Yes. Um, the, the question is, is regarding um, Hyperloop or uh, tube transport or other, I, I presume by this you mean high speed surface transport that will, uh, like for instance, bullet train. Um, the infrastructure cost, we've looked at the infrastructure cost. A pocket air park, depending on real estate cost, could be somewhere between one and two million dollars, including all the pavement. Um, the cost of the California bullet train, for example, Northern California to Southern California, I think they're estimating something like $12 billion for it at, at the present time. And it gets you from one point to one other point. It's not distributed. And once you get to those two points, there are masses of people there waiting at the Hertz rental desk and waiting to take that Hertz bus out to the parking lot and get their car and then get stuck in gridlock. And, Again, the reason this is so transformational is that it is going to circumvent all that infrastructure cost and take us point to point through the 3D airspace that's available to us and for which we now have the technologies to utilize. You mentioned uh, competition for me. Um, to, oh, oh, hello. Uh, you mentioned a competition for wheel motors to uh, decrease takeoff distance. I was wondering if you are looking into anything like a high start or a catapult or something that would be ground-based um, and would just stay on the ground um, to achieve that as well. Uh, we've had a great 
deal of discussion about these kinds of supplemental infrastructures, the carrier catapult, the uh, launch cart, uh, even the uh, you know trapeze on which the plane would perch instead of using pavement. And the general consensus is someday maybe, but let's use what we have. We've got 5,000 public use airports waiting, tremendously underutilized, waiting to be used by these sky taxis. And the key placement of some of these pocket air parks in the really uh, high traffic hubs are, are going to fulfill a good deal of the demand uh, early on without need. This notion that I'm in a vehicle that doesn't have to choose only those landing sites that have put in their catapults, but instead I can go anywhere, is attractive. And I think is probably the model that will win out in the beginning. Um, as these other things come about, uh, who knows? Maybe the real estate pressure will be so much that we're going to have to get down to 125-foot circles that have, you know, little launch devices or, or perch trapezes or what. But our assessment, based on the USGS land use data, is that there's kind of this magic number, this two and a half acres that you can kind of fit anywhere, just looks like it's going to work. And the wheel motors will make it work. And the wheel motors give you all these other goodies, you know, the, the braking, the steering, and, and so forth. So we think the wheel motor is a really crucial piece. Hi. Um, so the sky taxi concept, I think you said at your you envision a autonomous system to fly most of these sky taxis around. However, on a chart, I believe I saw that you wanted to have a mechanical backup system in case of the system's failures, I presumably, for safety's sake. Uh, if it's an autonomous system, though, will the passengers need to be certified pilots in order to take advantage of that mechanical system? This is a great question, and I'm really glad you asked this because I, I didn't cover it properly. Um, the CAFE Foundation sees the five-year Green Flight Challenge program as really just the beginning launch demonstrator. It is only to prove what can be done. Those safety pilots are there with a ready mechanical stick and rudder for safety because CAFE Foundation, we're not going to stake our lives and our livelihoods on any liability for an event in which we don't have every possible precaution. And this is the near term. I am confident that eventually the autonomy will make that stick and rudder a joke. And I am confident that it wouldn't be too long before the sky taxi pilot being paid $120,000 a year to simply sit there and pretend like he's touching the stick and rudder when the plane does everything with super precision would be supplanted. But in the early implementations, uh, at least out there in the public, I think we're, CAFE is going to probably have to insist on this kind of mechanical backup. And yet, what you've really hit upon is a role for Dryden, you know, a, a role for the really professional flight test facilities to explore, develop, and prove those kinds of full autonomy where we no longer need that stick and rudder. And I think this offers up a tremendous opportunity for linkage and partnership between the CAFE Foundation and Dryden uh, for f future progress. I commend you on your vision for the Sky Taxi and the overall vision for the, uh, advan the advances uh, in, in uh, flight in general. Uh, kind of following on to what Jack said here, I uh, picked up on a little bit of the same. I think we're almost there with with autonomy. I think that's, you know, we're, that, that's a great area that we've been researching, and uh, I think that uh, uh, you're right. That's that's really going to be the next the, the next major hurdle. hurdle. Uh, you you as a private pilot, me as a private pilot, and you as the foundation. You say you have to have this backup. And I think a lot of these changes are going to come and are already coming from EAA and people who are very interested, who are private pilots, experimental pilots. So with that thought in mind, 
even though the this big vision is for the autonomous vehicle for the world to be able to have this great uh, transportation system, what about the general aviation community who are still pilots who still want to have uh, you know, this kind of a vehicle with the manual stick and rudder because they still want to do some flying when they're going, you know, on their 200 mile trip. This really touches me because I love to fly and I love to go out and go where I want. And it's obvious that the sky taxi system is point to point, not only point to point, but four dimensional, meaning there's a time track that you must stay on as you make that route. Otherwise you'll be considered a terrorist and uh, somebody will pop your parachute without you wanting it. But the, the question of, for example, airspace division, will the sky taxis all operate at 2,000 AGL and below? Because there's no need for them to go any higher. They're just making short hops and keep all that airspace up above for, for EAA. <laughs> I don't know the answer to this, but I do know that my, my overall sense of the Green Flight Challenge program is it won't just be to show the way toward an expansion of sky taxi research. It'll rejuvenate EAA tremendously. It, I think, has promised to make all the EAA airplanes better, safer, more fun, cleaner, you know, e emission-free. And I think of it myself <clears throat> in my own flying Cessna and Mooney, I would love to have a full autonomy system that if I wanted to, I could just punch that button and sit back and not have to be on the stick and rudder. Uh, I enjoy the stick and rudder and many people do. And of course, we'll still have aerobatics and we'll still have all of these things. But I do not think that the Green Flight Challenge program or Sky Taxi system should be looked upon as eliminating or displacing that whole world of sport aviation and pilotage. Thank you. So Europe, Europe is already, um, they're already certifying electric aircraft, small electric aircraft, um, and the FAA um, has not been able to get there yet. What's holding them back? Well, fortunately, <clears throat> Congress has just passed a measure in, that put on a fast track the rewrite of FAR Part 23. The certification standard for small aircraft now is going to be rewritten. The F-44 AST committee that is doing the rewrite is a committee that I'm participating in. And just last week, we had a meeting in which they handed us this document that was so old and talked about piston engines and BSFC and, and all of these things and it's falling on my shoulders, um, among others on the committee, to go in and rewrite and add the paragraphs that have to do with electric powered airplanes. So we have this wonderful opportunity to weave in to the next part 23, the necessary paragraphs that will allow these electric airplanes to get licensed. And one of the wonderful things about the Green Flight Challenge 1 was that we got those electric airplanes licensed thanks to the EAA system and to the FAA system that recognized EAA and said, guess what? There's a thing called an experimental exhibition license. And that's what you are, you strange bird, you electric plane. We're gonna give you that license so that you can go compete in the GFC-1. And that's this wonderful entry pathway that unfortunately does not exist for the powered lift versions that are going to come along, but it will, it'll get there. But again, the low hanging fruit, the proximate thing, if you want to get this going and do it before the decade is out, that is the path. And since we are going to do this rewrite and Congress wants it completed before the end of 2015, I think we've got a lot, a lot of uh, wordsmithing to do to, to weave in the electric airplane language there. And I would welcome any input from you professionals that will help us do that. Do we have any more questions? No? Well, I want to thank Brian for coming out and spending his time with us. Let's give him a round of applause.